Hi, and welcome into Real Conversations. I am Thomas Manning here with the Real to Real Film Festival. So grateful to be joined today by Chris Hudson. He is the director of the documentary, The Mayberry Effect, which we're going to be taking a look at uh, submission for submission and selection for the Real to Real Film Festival. So thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yes, sir. And uh, start things out, uh, anything you want to share in general about your background in filmmaking and television is quite an extensive background for sure, but just anything you want to touch on there? I, I've been doing this for about 20 years now. Um, I think I got started when I was in college at Queens College in Charlotte and uh, did an internship over at WTVI and, and was able to connect with the documentary filmmakers there. And I just loved it. I've loved it ever since. So that was my happy place there growing up and uh, they gave me some projects to do after I graduated some World War II films and uh, just done it ever since then so uh, yeah that's that's been able to do some interesting projects um, and wanted to branch out from World War II projects and so this was kind of the, the first time I was in kind of full control of my own feature length film and so I'm glad I've got that experience doing World War II but I'm Glad to jump into different and unique stories as well. Yeah, so here with the Mayberry Effect, it kind of examines the lasting impact of the Andy Griffith Show and also its relationship with Mount Airy, North Carolina, the town of Mount Airy. And uh, I was really impressed with just the vast amount of interviews and people you were able to track down for this uh, project. You had super fans and impersonators of the show. You had family members of the cast, you had like scholars and, you know, psychology professionals. So how long and how difficult was it to track down all of these individuals from different backgrounds uh, for all these interviews? It, I, it took me about four years to kind of get everything I felt like I needed to get. Uh, of course, there are a few people I didn't get to do the interviews with. Um, but the ones that I did, uh, it, the, the whole idea of the film kind of started around just following tribute artists. So I knew I could get access to them through David Browning, the, da uh, the Mayberry deputy. Um, but when and David Browning, the Mayberry deputy, told me this was a much bigger picture than just the tribute artists and people just dressing up, that's when I really had to start doing a lot more research and, and trying to find the people that could explain what I was interested in. And so, and during the whole four years, I was able to get, con you know, contacts and connected and introduced to Andy Griffith's daughter and Don Knotts' daughter and uh, Betty Lynn, who lives in Mount Airy, and then all the other tribute artists. And then just kind of doing research on nostalgia kind of led me over to England to interview the two psychology professors there at Southampton University. Um, so that's, so it, it took a while. Um, you know, one year I might get six or seven interviews. The second year I might get another six or seven interviews. So, uh, but it kind of paced it out. So, but it was a fun process. Yeah, and um, David Browning in particular, he seems like quite the fascinating character. And uh, this seemed like there was a lot of emotion behind this project for him specifically because he's kind of, it was almost a send off for him in his role as uh, the Mayberry deputy. So uh, you want to discuss that a little bit? Sure, yeah, David David was the reason why I started this film. So I, I, I will answer your question in a little bit, uh, in a little bit, but yeah, David, I met David on a set of a, a car commercial uh, I was uh, helping my former boss with in Kernersville, North Carolina. And David was dressing up as the Barney Five character and doing their commercials for the car dealership. And when I met him, I was in grad school at Wake Forest at the time trying to get my master's in documentary film and I was looking for a thesis project. And when I met David, I said, he's an interesting character. I need to kind of follow him. And uh, when I talked to him about it, he's like, hey, there's a bigger picture here, but you know, I'll sit down and do the initial interview with you. And uh, then he said, go up to Mount Airy during Mayberry Days and I'll introduce you to everybody else. And that's what he did. And over four years, kind of followed him at a number of different festivals and events. And um, he really, really was kind of the, I guess, the mentor, you know, the, the sounding board, I guess, through this, this whole process, the, one of the few that I really went to back and forth. And um, when the film was finally done, since the whole film festival thing has kind of got gone a little crazy this year in 2020, uh, was able to show the film at two different film festivals earlier this year, and then COVID hit. 
And so I hadn't had a chance to go visit with David. I hadn't get, had a chance to, to travel back to Virginia and show him personally. So we watched it together via um, FaceTime. And so he watched it and I watched his reaction. And it really, like you said, it was kind of a, kind of a send off, kind of almost kind of a, um, what do you, what do you, almost kind of a tribute to David, at all of his work as well. So his reaction was amazing to watch and that's exactly what I wanted. So I wanted, I wanted it to, I wanted it to feel like he'd done a really good job cause he had, and he, he really did kind of help uh, this whole Mayberry process and this whole Mayberry events and just influencing so many of the tribute artists. Um, so I, I wanted it to be a tribute to him as well. Um, but he, but since he was on, he's kind of on the way out of doing all these big events, he didn't want it to be all about him. And so I still wanted to center some of the story around him as one of the main characters, but then add everything else that I added to it. So. Yeah. Yeah. He was one of those guys that I was like, he just seems like such an interesting individual to be around. But so I was really pleased that y'all uh, centered so much the story around him. Um, so looking more to the kind of philosophical and psychological examination of nostalgia, within this documentary. Um, just how did that kind of open your eyes to the way that we perceive the Andy Griffith show and perceive the quote, good old days, I guess you could say. I, I think it, it's interesting to me, the idea of nostalgia and the understanding of nostalgia has really changed my perspective of the world. So there's a lot of people, a lot of fans, that love the Andy Griffith show and are so nostalgic for the show and that time frame. However, the show wasn't real. So, so the question of, you know, are you nostalgic for a real time or, or that television time is always going to be the question. Um, having been a filmmaker for 20 years and going back 20 years of the, the trend of kind of bouncing different ideas off of different people and then letting the audience decide where they wanted to land with, um, whatever they thought about nostalgia was kind of how my approach, I didn't want to come in with a full out point of view straight up, you know, nostalgia is simple time is this kind of approach. I wanted to lay both sides of it out there and let, let people decide for themselves. Um, but you do have people on both sides of the spectrum, you know, that some say, Hey, it was a, a better time. Some say it wasn't. Um, so you just kind of have to consider, a lot of other factors, I think, when you say it's a, it was a simpler time. It all depends on who you talk to. It all depends on where they grew up, how they grew up, um, sometimes what part of the side of the tracks they were on. So, it, you know, I couldn't ever feel comfortable enough to decide, hey, th this was a simpler time and you need to agree with me as a filmmaker. Um, but I think it's amazing during this COVID, corona, you know, situation, pandemic we're going through, I'm kind of feeling nostalgic for this past March, this past February, this past January. Um, and, and I think, like, Dr. Constantine Sadikides, like, just nails it when he says, you know, being nostalgia, isn't, nostalgia isn't about the past, it's more about the future. And so if you're, if you're able to pull the good things out of the past and it helps you direct you in a better uh, line and a better path towards the future, then I think that's very, very important for all of us to kind of to think of, like, how can we learn from our past? How can we enjoy the good times? How can we learn from that? And it structure us towards a better path for the future of how we treat people, how we treat the world, how we treat our earth, everything. So I think nostalgia is so powerful. It's amazing. Um, it's, you know, I, I'm going back and watching a lot of old TV shows, cartoons, you know, I'm going back to my Lego collection and being nostalgic for times back then, listen to 80s music when I grew up, 80s and 90s music. So it makes me feel more like me, I think, when I feel nostalgic. But then I also hope that I can share, you know, those good feelings with my kids and other people in the future. So it's so powerful. Um, and I just wanted that to come across going, it's okay to be nostalgic about the past. It's totally okay to be nostalgic. But, you know, is that going to just set you in stone right then and there? Are you not going to go anywhere from that? You're just going to kind of do Groundhog Day and relive your life every single day the same way? Or, you know, how can you bring those good feelings and, and influence others, I believe? Yeah, and uh, for the town of Mount Airy, North Carolina, 
there's kind of conflicting reports over the years, especially with members of the cast. Was it directly based on Mount Airy? Was it kind of an amalgamation of a lot of different North Carolina towns? Even Andy Griffith himself seemed to kind of be on the fence either way. So just some of your research and uh, some of your experiences with the town, you know, what, what is your, where do you fall on that side of the fence? I kind of think that it's hard for me to believe that, you know, Andy didn't bring so much from Mount Airy into that show. Um, and, you know, I've been through his interviews and I've, and I've talked to so many different people. Um, and there's, uh, it's hard for me to believe they couldn't have been influenced by where he grew up and the people that he met. Um, but that doesn't mean everything, you know, it had to be the, the, the entire influence for the show. I mean, you had so many other writers and some of those writers, you know, were from all over the country. I mean, from California to New York state and some of them lived in small towns. So they brought their own kind of, you know, feel to it as well. Um, I, you know, I, it, it kind of seemed to me during the making of this documentary and just the footage that I came across that, you know, even with his speech um, to Mount Airy, kind of, him never really st still didn't seem to answer the question. He still kind of left it a big question mark, but how everybody reacted, it seemed like they believed he either caved in or that they were right and he was wrong. So I, you know, I, I think it's going to be a question that people keep exploring and, and arguing about. Um, but in the end of the day, you know, it, Mayberry means a lot more than just, you know, who created it, how it was created. It's more about, you know, kind of the feeling that it gives you. So, you know, if we can get past the argument and just go, Hey, you know, Mayberry is a much bigger thing than just an argument, just where it came from. Uh, it, it just does us all much better. So. Yeah, I think one of my favorite quotes from the documentary, um, you had Dan Browning talking about something Don Knott said that with the Andy Griffith show, all they wanted to do was tell a good story. And Dan Browning followed that up with, and good stories last, which it certainly has. So just what is that, what does hearing that mean to you as the director? I mean, I think it's such an amazing show. This, I mean, the show's never been off the air. So it's always been on the air in some form or fashion. And even today, you can find it anywhere you need to find it uh, if you want to watch the episode. So that's just amazing. Um, you know, the good story lasts because of the lessons that were in the show. You know, the way that each, each person treated other people. Um, you know, the, the way that the, the town was set up. And, you know, they really did help other people during the whole process it wasn't always a guilty first you know innocent later it was let's try to figure out this issue um so i think those those lessons just last a lifetime i think we're missing so much of that today um because i think people realize it's a it's a show you can leave your kids in the room and watch and you can leave the room for 30 minutes um, and you're not going to worry about anything, you know, profanity or any, anything bad going on that's going to hurt your kids. So it's very, very enduring. It's, uh, I think Andy got it right in so many ways and the writers got it right in so many ways. And, you know, we just need more of that. Um, so had we had more shows like that today, I think we'd be a better off as a society. Um, so I think that's why it's just lasted so long. And it's, it's been great. David Browning and the tribute artists and what Mount Airy's done um, to really kind of perpetuate that, that story. Um, just when you go to a Mayberry Days, it's more like a family reunion than it is a, um, just a convention or just a hanging out. So, you know, you walk away from those kind of events just happy. And that's what the Andy Griffith Show has left us with. It's just a happier time in life, a happier show we all get to watch and escape from the realities for at least 30 minutes yeah so i have a pretty big well a long-reaching familial connection to the andy griffith show my uh, great grandfather he passed away like 15 years ago or so but he was a massive john wayne fan and a massive andy griffith fan they're probably his two biggest like celebrities that he just admired and uh, any, if there were two things he could watch for the rest of his life, it would be John Wayne Westerns and the Andy Griffith show. And uh, I'm sure he'd greatly appreciate this documentary that you made. Oh, great. Well, yeah. 
Well, that's great. I, I, I mean, my parents grew up watching this show. So many of the other people that I've met and have shared it with their grandkids and, and passed it on down. And, you know, there is so much competition today of other shows and YouTube and everything that we can find online. Um, but I, I tried to share it with my daughter while I was doing research, uh, just watching the episodes and kind of finding the best examples I could. And my, uh, my daughter, I don't remember, she might've been five or six at the time. She's like, I don't want to watch that black and white show. And I was like, all right, just sit here and watch one. And eight episodes later, she got up and said, Hey, that Barney Fife was a, a funny character. I liked him a lot. And I was like, you realize you just watch eight episodes without moving. So it definitely hooked you. So, you know, I totally, totally understand where your grandfather is coming from and, and other fans that are coming from. I find it so interesting that there are some people out there that are such huge fans of something. So I, I can't think of, uh, of what I'm such a huge fan of um, where I go to the extreme of, you know, having thousands of pieces of paraphernalia, memorabilia, or have watched everything that somebody's done. So I'm so fascinated with with all the the characters in the documentary of of their just love and devotion to the Andy Griffith show. Um, so it just fascinates me and just enjoy spending time and asking them questions. Why? Like, like <laughs> uh, explain to me why you would you know spend all this money on this. And so, so I understand. Well, uh, before we wrap things up here, anything else you want to share about the documentary about production uh, that I maybe I didn't touch upon? I think like, like I want people to know that the Andy Griffith show is just so much more than the show itself. Um, like I explore this in the documentary, but I think people don't realize how influential that show has been on the entertainment industry. Um, so if you're able to see the documentary, you'll find out why, and you'll see examples of that, why that's that people, who aren't that heavy into the Andy Griffith show, but might like, you know, other pop culture like Seinfeld or the Simpsons will totally end up seeing a connection between the Andy Griffith show and, and those very, very popular shows. Um, so, you know, to go back to your other question of, you know, it's enduring uh, time and, you know, it's been around for so long, it, it, it just influenced so many people. Um, but I think like, it's been interesting over the making of the documentary, I had one idea of, of which direction I wanted to take the documentary. And then now what all is going on in our, in our world, I think it's just even more important for it to come out for people to see so that it can at least start a discussion. Like, I don't want to tell people what to think. I want us to like, you know, you experience the arguments either side and then let's have a discussion after the film. Um, whether you like something, whether you don't like something. Um, but, you know, it, it touches base on, African Americans in the Andy Griffith show, were there any or were there not? Um, I think that's a very important discussion that we need to have today. Um, I think, you know, we need to have a discussion of how we're treating people, how, how the police are treating people, how we're treating the police. I think, uh, I think it can help raise a number of questions and not that we're going to figure out all the answers, but at least we have to start having a dialogue. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that kind of civil dialogue is what we're all missing today in so many aspects of our society. And, um, I do hope that this documentary can spark some of those discussions. Um, is there anywhere, anywhere people can keep up with your work, whether that be through social media, anything like that? Yeah, I've got, uh, let's see. Yeah. So I'm, uh, you can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and my website's the Mayberry effect.com. And then my Instagram handle is the Mayberry effect movie and Twitter's like Mayberry effect one. And on Facebook, it's just the Mayberry effect, the movie. So yeah, if you want to, you can subscribe to the website, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, just kind of keep updated with everything that's going on and trying to let everybody know whatever film festivals it gets into. And, and uh, if, if I get distribution eventually put in place, you know, when and where that will be. Um, and then just other, you know, fun Mayberry things that are going on. So well, thanks so much, Chris, for taking the time with us here at Real to Real today. We really appreciate you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to the festival. Yes, sir. And uh, Thomas Manning here with Real Conversations alongside Chris Hudson. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you for tuning in.